excited about skit night? Anybody? All right, I'm looking forward to it. I believe it's going to be spectacular. All right, got that out of the way. I had been requested to say spectacular, and I did. So now we can move on. <laughs> Have you ever been asked or told to do something that you thought was impossible or nearly impossible? Anybody? All right, we, we've all been there. How many of you, maybe when you looked at your music on Monday, right? thought, impossible, we're not going to be able to do this on Saturday, but you will and you can. But sometimes they, we come to God's Word and, and we read things and we think, wow, that's, that's really, really hard or that seems impossible for me to do. And I think we're going to encounter that feeling this morning, but I also believe we're going to see that as Paul continues to write to the church at Ephesus, that he's going to continue to call us out to do something that, yes, we can't do ourselves, but we absolutely can do through the power of the Holy Spirit. So if you have your Bible this morning, uh, let's begin in Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to begin in verse 1. Ephesians chapter 5, and beginning in verse 1. And Paul says this, he says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. So our, our word for today is imitate. Our word for today is imitate imitate. And look again at what Paul says. He says, be imitators of God. Now how many of you would say, that seems difficult? Right? Like, what are you saying, Paul? How, I mean, how are we supposed to imitate God? Right? That, I mean, he's the creator and the sustainer of the, of the universe. He, he's the one who holds all things together by his power. How do we imitate God? He is holy and perfect and how could we even begin to, to think about being imitators of God? Well, Paul's going to, to lay out some things in the text this morning that I think are going to challenge us, but also help us to see how we're to do this. But I, I just want to notice a couple of things there as far as imitators. But then he says, as beloved children. As beloved children. And Paul wanted them to know, as, as he has throughout this letter, that their motivation right, for wanting to do this, right, because we all need motivation, right, if we're going to do anything, we have to have motivation to do it, and if, if we're going to be motivated to be imitators of God, to live out the beautiful realities of the gospel, of what Jesus has done for us, we need motivation, and our motivation is always God's love for us, right, he says, you are beloved children. You are object of your Father in heaven's affection and his love. He demonstrated that love most clearly to you when he gave his son for you on the cross. And so he says, as, as one who has received the Father's love as a loved child, he calls us to be imitators of God. We're to imitate. Now, a few years ago, I was trying to take a picture with my daughter and I, so I squatted down so that we could be like on the same level, but unfortunately she squatted down too, all right? And she mimicked exactly what I was doing. You see, children are imitators, right? It, as, as a parent, you quickly realize that they start to imitate what you do. And even worse, they imitate what you say, right? There, there's, a, there's a season where you can kind of say things and they don't understand what you're saying, and then all of a sudden you realize they do understand what I'm saying. And my daughter has a habit of eavesdropping, right? She's, she's the eavesdropping child. In fact, when she was even four or five, somewhere in there, around five, we were talking in the one room one day, and she was playing in the other room, and she says, you know I'm listening. I was like, ooh, gotta be careful. But see, children are imitators. We're, we're born imitators. And, and more than we might want to admit or realize, all of us are imitators. And it doesn't it doesn't go away just when we, we, it doesn't go away just because we grow up, right? We imitate that which is around us, that's what we see, that what we look up to, right? I, I remember growing up, I, I, I used to imitate one of my favorite baseball players. I won't say his name because it's going to really incriminate me how old I was, and most of you probably never heard of him anyway. But I used to imitate how he held the bat, everything that he did, because I wanted to be like him. We are naturally born to imitate. And so Paul takes that theme of that we are naturally born imitators and calls us, he says, to imitate God. But that seems so abstract, doesn't it? Right? Like, how do we even begin to do that? It makes sense that, that physical children would imitate their parents because they can see them and hear them. But how do we imitate God? Well, I think it really is the same thing. 
it involves us seeing and knowing and hearing God. So how do we see God? How do we know God? How do we imitate Him? Well, let's look at verse 2 as Paul begins to lay this out for us. He says, if we're going to imitate God, that we need to walk in love as Christ loved us and gave Himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Walk in love. Walk there refers to our life. He says we're to live lives of love. If we're going to imitate God, then we need to look at Jesus, right? Because Jesus was God come in human flesh. The Creator God came and lived among us. And here's the thing. Jesus didn't just swoop down from heaven and go to the cross and save us and go back to heaven. He lived here for over 30 years. And He became man. He lived among us. And one of the purposes of Him coming to spend that much time was to show us how to live. Right? He showed us as an example of how to live. And so he says we are to walk in love. How? As Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Jesus came, yes, to show us how to live. But his ultimate mission was to fulfill the Father's purpose by becoming the sacrifice for our sins. And really, really, we, we really need to never ever get over how great the Father's love for us that he would give his Son. For you and for me. He says Christ loved us and he gave himself up for us. He willingly went to that cross for you and for me. He paid the penalty for your sin and for my sin. Out of his incredible love for us. He rose from the dead. He ascended to the Father where he intercedes for you and for me. And for all of his children. And he's coming again one day in power and glory. But he also showed us how to live. We are called to be imitators of Jesus' life. You know, I think about the fact that Jesus was the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I, you know, we, we read Colossians 1 this past Friday, if you're with us at the bonfire, but I love how it describes Jesus, right? It, and it paints such a beautiful picture of Him. If, if you haven't just read Colossians 1 lately, just I'd encourage you to do that. But, but thinking about the fact that Jesus was the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, He's the Creator and the Sustainer of life, and yet when He lived on earth, He walked everywhere that He went, right? Except for His entry into Jerusalem. He, he spent time with people from the bottom of society. Right? He, he purposely and intentionally spent time with people that no one else wanted to spend time with. Right? The people that we often look over or look down on, Jesus spent time with. And even ate meals with them. Right? He ate meals with prostitutes. He ate meals with tax collectors. Right? And we don't understand fully what it meant to be a tax collector. It meant to be a traitor. Right? These were Jewish people who sold themselves out to Rome and who collected Rome, Rome's taxes on the Jewish people. But they didn't just collect the taxes. They extorted the people out of as much money as they could because they were allowed to keep everything they could get that they didn't have to turn over to Rome. And so people hated tax collectors, but Jesus had meals with them. People looked down on them, but Jesus was kind to them. He showed his mercy and his kindness to the undeserving. I love John chapter 8, and I love the, the amazing picture, the story that we read there about how Jesus was teaching one day in the courtyard of the temple. And, and, and some religious leaders had grabbed a woman who they said was caught in the act of adultery. It was funny that they didn't find the man too. But because they had an agenda. And their agenda was to trick and to trap Jesus. And they, they didn't care a bit about this woman. And so they drag her into the, into the courtyard while Jesus is teaching. Right? And you can kind of imagine. How many of you get distracted easily? Right? I, you can imagine the distraction is everybody. They're listening to Jesus. But they're like... What's going on here? This group of men is dragging this woman in here. And, and they accuse her and they said, the law says we get to stone her. Right? And Jesus gets down and, and draws in the dirt. And you'll remember. And then he says, sure, you can stone her. Just whoever, whoever is without sin, you can throw the first stop, rock. And it says, by, from oldest to youngest, they began to drop their rocks and to leave. And then Jesus looked at her and he says, woman, where are your accusers? And she says, there are none. And he says, neither do I accuse you. Go and sin what? No more. Right? Jesus looked at her with eyes of grace and eyes of compassion. But he also challenged her then to live a new kind of life that was distinctly different. Jesus showed mercy and kindness to the undeserving. He served instead of demanding to be served. He taught that greatness comes not by trying to grab power, but by being willing to give up your life for others. 
The night before he went to the cross, he washed his disciples' feet, a task that was reserved for the lowest of the low slaves. And so we become imitators of Jesus when we look at his life and when we love the way he loved and we live the way he lived, when we say, I want to take the values and the, 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 the example of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit who lives in me, I want to live that life out. That's how we begin to be imitators of Jesus. And Paul says, we are to be imitators of God. We are to be ones who follow his example. But it's going to look really weird when we do that. Right? Because when we follow the example of Jesus, it's going to look very opposite of how culture tells us to live. It's going to look opposite of how we are taught to live by the world. And so God calls us as his children to live lives that are very different, as we talked about yesterday, very distinct. And one of those reasons is so that our lives can reflect Jesus and who he is and his grace and his mercy and his love. We were born to be imitators. The question isn't whether you're going to imitate. The question is who and what you're going to imitate. And I want to challenge you this morning. I want you to think about the fact that you have been called by God to imitate him. And we do that by seeing Jesus and looking at him and following his example. Now, Paul's going to continue to show how we live this out. And he's going to do it in an area of life that affects all of us. And it's an area of life that a lot of people need to be confronted in. So look at verse 3 because it's going to really step on our toes. He says, But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. You see, in the culture that, that Paul was writing to, right, they, they disregarded completely God's standard of morality and God's standard of sexuality. And because of that culture was so permissive and this because immorality was so pervasive in that culture, it started to affect the church's values. That even the followers of Christ were not always following God's ways, but they were following the ways of culture. And really, it's not any different today. But God hasn't changed and His standards haven't changed. And listen, God is good. And He loves you. And when He puts boundaries in His Word for us to follow, they're always for our good. Right? Even if we think it's not good or even if we don't understand it, listen, God loves you. And He wants to put good boundaries in your life. And so He says sexual immorality. That word is really the word that we get our word pornography from today. It, impurity means unclean, cleanness, covetousness there. It's talking about the greed for someone else's body. And it, listen, God's standard for sexuality is a husband and a wife. And that's not popular today. That's not a popular stand. And if you take that stand, you will be called names. You'll be looked down on. But God has not changed the standard. And we can hold that standard with grace and with humility Right? We don't expect people who don't know Jesus to follow God's standard, so we shouldn't think that they will. But if we are followers of Jesus, if we know Christ as our Savior, if our lives really belong to Him, if, if what Paul said is true, that my life is not my own, that I've been bought with a price, and therefore I'm to glorify God in my body, then we need to take seriously God's standard. And listen, God's plan for your life is good. And his plan for sexuality in your life is that you would experience it only in the bonds of marriage between a man and a woman. Right? And that doesn't mean that we won't experience temptations and desires outside of God's standards. Listen, temptation isn't sin. Having desires that go outside of God's boundaries are something we all experience. It's what we do with that. Am I willing to submit my desires? Am I willing to submit the temptations that I feel to God and say, God, I'm tempted to do this. I have desires to do this, but I believe your word. And by the power of your spirit, I want to follow you. Loving God begins with obedience. Jesus said, if you love me, obey my commandments. And, and he didn't say it shaking his finger at them. I believe he looked at his disciples when he shared that in John chapter 14 with eyes of love and compassion. He says, guys, if you love me, guys, if you love me, obey me. If you love me, trust me. If you love me, I promise that if you trust me and you follow me, you will experience my blessing. Loving others begins with putting their needs above our own, their well-being above our own. Loving others is always about placing their well-being their well above our own. And when it comes to the issue of sexuality, 
Right? When we go outside of God's boundaries, not only are we sinning against God, not only are we sinning, the Bible says, against ourself, but we're also leading someone else to sin against God. And that's a serious thing because that's not loving. Right? We're not loving someone when we lead them to sin. Paul was writing to a culture that glorified sex without boundaries. And our culture is the same. But listen, the wages of sin is death. Right? The wages of sin is death. And so this morning I want you to realize that this issue is important. And whether it's a relationship that you're in now or whether it's an issue with pornography, right? It's sin. But here's the thing. God loves you. He's not put off by your sin. He wants to set you free from your sin. And he wants you to realize that if you're going to be an imitator of God, if you're going to live this beautiful life that God's called you to live, you need to trust him in this area. And you need to be willing to surrender and submit to him. And, and trust me, if you do, you will experience that God really is good. And there really is freedom. And so if you are struggling in this area, I want to encourage you, you're in a place where it's safe to go to somebody and say, I, I need some help. Right? I, I have an addiction to pornography. I've got a problem. Right? Listen, you're not alone. No one here is going to look down on you. you can come, guys, you can come talk to me. Right? No one's going to put you down. We'll help you. Right? You're not alone. But you need to do something about it. If you're in a relationship where you're crossing boundaries that you shouldn't be crossing, you need to stop. You might need to break up with someone. That's okay. It, this issue is so, so important. Look at what he says in verse 4. He says, let there be no filthiness, no foolish talk, no cr nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. Right? We've already talked about the fact that in Christ, if we're going to live different, we need to talk different. He, he mentioned that in chapter 4. But here he's talking about sexuality and how we talk. Right? He's talking about vulgar jokes. He's talking about the way that we talk. And he says, if we're believers, we need to talk differently. He says, don't let any filthy talk come out of your mouth or foolish talk nor crudeness. He says, don't let these things come out of your life because imitating Christ calls us to talk different. And then Paul's going to warn us in verse 5. Look at what he says. He says, for you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Now, we want to step back and say, what's he saying? Is he saying we can lose our salvation? No. Is he saying that if you have sinned in this area, that that somehow means you're not a believer or not a Christian? No, that's not what he's saying. Right? We always want to be clear to interpret it in the context that Paul shares it. So if you know Christ, nothing can separate you from his love, not even your sin. But what he's saying, he's saying those whose lives have never been changed by Christ and whose pattern is only rebellion against God. He says, remember... It might look like they're having a great time. It might look like they're enjoying life. But he says, remember that they have no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and the kingdom of God. So then he says this in verse 6. Because, listen, we all tend to push back. How many of you push back against your parents? Come on, right? How many of you push back against your counselors here? Stop doing that. <laughs> we all have a tendency to push back. And so Paul says... I know you're going to push back. So he says in verse 6, he says, Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. So he says, he says, remember, like, that's not who you are. He says, remember your identity. Remember that you are, are not who you used to be. He says, you used to be like that. At one time you were in the dark, you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So walk as children of light. We're called to live differently and distinctly. And we're called as God's children to obey him and to follow him. Not because we have to earn his love. Not because we have to earn relationship with him. He, he loves you no matter what. His love for you is unending and it's constant. He loves you when you obey Him and He loves you when you disobey Him. He never stops loving you. But he, as a loving Father, He wants the best for you. And the best is always following His way. He wants your life to look different. He wants your life to reflect the reality of the Gospel. So He says in verse 11, Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light... 
it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. He says, Take no part, verse 11, in the unfruitful works of darkness. He says, Don't live like that. Listen, God's plan for you is good. He loves you. And listen, I know temptation is real. I know it's hard. Right? You live in a world where you have access to temptations like never before. Right? And, and you're not alone. But you need to set boundaries in this area of your life. You need to do whatever it takes to say, I want to follow God in this area. You will never regret it. I promise you, I've never met anyone, and I've counseled a lot of people over the years, I've never met anyone who said, I followed God's standard of sexuality, and I, I'm so regretful. Right? I, I just, I regret obeying Jesus in this area. I, I can't believe I obeyed Him. I've never had one person say that, but I've had many people with heartache and pain in their hearts say, my life is a mess because I've went outside of God's standard. I'm full of guilt and shame. My relationship is affected. Right? God loves you. So you need to set standards because here's the thing we often like to do. We often like to think, how close can I get? Right? How close can I get to the edge? How close? Is it a sin if? And that's the wrong question. Right? Because how many of you are saying you're a little uncomfortable with me standing right here? Anybody? All right, clumsy people shouldn't stand this close to the edge. Right? So if I stand here and I make a mistake, if I take a step that I shouldn't take, what's going to happen? Help me out. I'm going to fall and I'm going to break something probably because I'm old. But if I step back here and I set my boundaries here and I make a mistake, what do I do? I haven't fallen, have I? I but I realize, whoa, I went too far. I need to step back. You need to set boundaries in your life. Jesus says that we need to imitate him, to live in his light. Listen, the gospel, it's so beautiful, right? We were darkness. We were separated from God. But God in his grace and his mercy reached out to us and he, he loved us and he gave himself for us. And that's our motivation, right? That's our motivation to be imitators of God. And it begins, listen, you can't imitate God until you know God. Right? And you don't know God until you've come to a place where you've recognized your need of Jesus as your Savior. And I don't, I don't want any of us to, to have been here this week and, and, and gone through the amazing experience that Che has and missed the fact that you and I need Jesus. Right? There, there is no other name given among men by which we can be saved. Right? There's only one way to be right with God. There's only one way to be forgiven. There's only one way to become a citizen of God's kingdom. And that's Jesus. And I don't want any of you to miss that the most important thing you could hear this week is that God loves you, that Jesus died for you, that he rose from the dead. That's what makes his message distinct from every other religious message. right? Because every religious message out there is you need to do this, believe this, follow this in order to get this. And God's message is, I gave my son for you. He did it for you. He died for you. He rose for you. He ascended to the Father and He invites you into His kingdom. And you come by faith, repenting of your sin and believing in Jesus as your Savior. And if you've never done that, I want to invite you to do that. But if you have done that, I, I want to invite you to say, I want to be an imitator of God through following Jesus. Right? And that means I really need to know Him. Right? I need to seek Him. I don't just need to know about Him, but to know Him. Not just to hear of Him, but to see Him for who He is. And to live out my life in Christ. Let's go back to verse 1. Ephesians chapter 5. Be imitators of God as beloved children. His love for you is your motivation. Right? He loves you so much. He's rooting for you. And so I want to ask you this morning, where, where's your focus? Where's your focus? If you're going to be an imitator of God, our focus must be on Jesus. We must live lives with our eyes focused on Him. And then through the power of the Holy Spirit to seek to follow Him. And listen, none of us are going to do this perfectly. Right? The Christian life is not about perfection. Right? I know some of you are perfectionists. That's great. Many of you are perfectionists. But don't let that, you know, sometimes that hinders us because we get frustrated because we are not going to follow Jesus perfectly. I don't follow Jesus perfectly. And neither do you. But that's not the point. The point is that we should be running after Him every day 
right? And when we stumble or when we fall, we have a God who forgives. First John chapter 1, verse 9 says what? If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We get His forgiveness and we keep going and we keep walking towards Him. What's your focus? I want to call you today to be an imitator of God through following Jesus, living a life of love, living a life of humility, but in the area of our sexuality, saying, I want to, by God's grace, to follow His design and His standard. I want to live distinctly and differently. You'll never, ever regret it. You'll never regret it. But I also want you to think about how you look at people. Right? How do you look at people? How do I see the people that I encounter every day? Right? Because we have a tendency sometimes to look down on people that are different than us down on people who we think aren't as intelligent as us or as talented as us, right? And God calls us to look at people and to see them how he sees them, right? Jesus saw people not as problems, not as their issues, not as their sin, but he saw them for people whom he created and whom he loved and whom he wanted to invite into his kingdom. Maybe there's some people in your life that you've been looking down on that God wants you to reach out to and to show His kindness and His love and His grace. When we become imitators of Jesus, we'll live lives that are upside down to this world, but they will point to Jesus, right? Because we, He says we're light. We're to, to live as children as light. And light attracts attention, right? And God wants the attention of the light that He shines through our lives to point to Him and to Jesus. Corey Ten Boom said this. She says, when we are powerless to do a thing, it is a great joy that we can come and step inside the ability of Jesus. Listen, she knew all about hardship. She survived a Nazi concentration camp. And she did so by God's grace. She knew about hard things. And listen, it's hard to follow. It's impossible. But God gives you the power. Jesus lives in you through the Holy Spirit. And he will help you. Would you bow your heads this morning? I want to pray over you this morning. And if, 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 if something has convicted you this morning, you'd say, you know what, I, I really want to imitate God, but, but I'm, not really, I'm not really living in a way that, that I know is pleasing to Him. And there's an area of your life that, that you need to deal with. Maybe it's your attitude towards people. Maybe it's humility that God's wanting to put in your life. And you need to say, Jesus spent time with people that were nothing like Him. And Jesus was willing to reach out to people who are broken and messy and dirty. And maybe I need to start doing that. Or maybe it's in the area of sexuality. You'd say, you know, there's some things in my life that I know are not pleasing to him. I'm, I, I have a pornography problem. I, I'm in a relationship I shouldn't be in. I, I'm acting out on desires that I know are contrary to God's word. I, I want you to confess that to God. But I also want to encourage you to reach out to someone who's safe. Right? And you're in a safe place that you have people you can talk to. You can talk to your counselor. You can talk to your teacher. You can talk to me. There are people here who love you and want to help you. But I want to encourage you to do something about that. Father in heaven, we come before you this morning. And Father, we confess that we all, we all need your grace. Father, we all fall short of being imitators of you. But Father, I pray we wouldn't allow the fact that we fail sometimes to keep us from pursuing that for which you died for us. And so, Father, I pray for each person here this morning. Father, I pray that, that more than anything, they'd understand how much you love them. I pray that they would remember that you gave your son for them and that there's nothing more important than knowing you. And, Father, I pray that understanding that love would cause them to want to be an imitator of you and cause me to want to be an imitator of you. And Father, I pray that we'd be willing to, to follow you even in the areas where it's hard and even the areas that, that, that culture says you can do whatever you want. But Father, may as we, your children, say we want to follow you. We want to obey you. I pray you'd set free those that may be bound by sin and may they know the joy that comes from your forgiveness. May they know the freedom that comes from their sin being washed clean and living life with your grace and your help. And I ask this in Jesus' name.